Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Adams and welcome to my course project presentation for Dr. Wu's wireless communications course at the University of Florida. Those explosions you just witnessed are known as improvised explosive devices or IEDs and they've been used extensively in Afghanistan and Iraq to target and kill United States soldiers. These are often detonated with common household items that are infrared devices such as garage door openers and television remote controls. However, an increasing number of these are utilizing radio frequency devices because they offer the attacker the advantage of being very far away in order to detonate the device. My course project uses our study of the channel impairments that we learned about in the course in an endeavor to actually make the channel worse to get it to a point to where in a localized area cellular communications are no longer sustained while still retaining cellular communications outside of the defensive perimeter. Now let's go ahead and step through my PowerPoint presentation to see exactly how we achieve this. The first step of the project involved deciding what subcomponents to model. I decided upon these five baseband message generator, a representative transmitter, modeling the channel itself, uh, utilizing Rayleigh fading and additive white Gaussian noise, modeling a representative receiver, and then modeling the symbol recovery and message reconstruction circuitry. Being relatively new to MATLAB before this course, I wanted to keep it simple but still hit the, the key components. I also wanted to attempt to add some real world emphasis to the project. I didn't want to just use a series of random variables. I wanted to actually use something more concrete as the data for transmission. So I built a user interface that allows the user to decide if they would like to enter ASCII characters via the keyboard or if they would actually like to read in a JPEG file. Now I use the built-in matrix manipulation features of MATLAB and a knowledge of the ASCII and JPEG data structures to manipulate those data structures and ultimately break them down into a serial bit stream of binary numbers for entry into the transmitter. Transmitter consists of these three components, pulse shaper and just a very basic amplifier in the form of a uh, user selectable amplitude for the uh, QPSK modulation and the QPSK modulator itself. Here's your QPSK with your in-phase component at the top, your quadrature phase at the bottom, 90 degrees out of phase from each other, and your high frequency carrier uh, that actually generates your uh, high frequency as you are implementing the equation below to encode your bits. Low pass filter implemented there is the uh, pulse shaper. The raised cosine pulse shaper actually serves two primary functions. First, used in lieu of a square pulse, which has many frequencies used to make up the square shape and which can uh, bleed into adjacent frequencies, the smooth shape of the raised cosine pulse shape keeps uh, your frequency contained in your desired spectrum. It also results in the sides of the sync function dampening out more quickly so that you have less intersymbol interference from one pulse to the next. It's more of a player with frequency selective fading channels, but wanted to have a representative pulse shaper used here in this system. Now, after pulse shaping and QPSK modulation, here is a sample transmitted pulse that then goes into the channel. As I mentioned before, the channel models both Rayleigh flat fading and additive white Gaussian noise. The Rayleigh fading channel is modeled based on the probability distribution function you see here, which we studied in the course. And the additive white Gaussian noise is actually created using a built-in function of MATLAB that overlays that onto the signal as well. So you have both in this channel. Here is a sample pulse after it's been through that 
very destructive channel. As you can see, it's broken down uh, pretty significantly from what we saw before, but we're going to send it to the receiver and uh, hopefully we can recover that signal. The receiver consists of three, these three components, a coherent QPSK demodulator, low pass filter and decision circuit. Here is your representative QPSK receiver where you have your in-phase component at the top, quadrature phase at the bottom. Carrier recovery circuit here for purposes of this effort was assumed to be perfect knowledge of the transmitted signal. So I did not build the carrier recovery circuit to rebuild the carrier frequency from the received signal. After the signal has been multiplied by the sine and cosine carrier frequencies, it is then sent to the low pass filter because when you have signal multiplication, uh, you actually generate twice the frequency. So the low pass filter actually pulls out that higher frequency and leaves you with the DC component that remains, and that is then sent to your decision circuit to recover your bits for in phase and quadrature phase. Now, let's go ahead and do a demonstration using the actual code. Here is the running code where you can actually select what type of data structure you want to send through the channel. In this case, we're not going to use the JPEG image file, which needs on the order of about nine hours to process all that data. Instead, we're going to just use the keyboard entry. You can enter any message as long or as short as you like in ASCII, and it will then send it through the channel. So let's just say now it gives you the option of SNR, so we'll say 16, good representative starting point based on this channel. That works for a moment and then gives you your original message, your recovered message and bit error rate of zero for that high of an SNR for this channel. Now we'll demonstrate this one more time and use a lower value of SNR. say 4 dB. Now actually when it runs many times you can compile a lot of data which I'll get to later on in the slideshow that shows a whole host. This is just to demonstrate how you, as you can see it generates a message that can't even be, uh, be understood uh, that's enhanced because if any one bit of an ASCII code of the seven characters is off, then the whole character is off, but still that's an 18% bit error ratio. Okay, now let's go look at some of the uh, collected data. After executing many runs, 30 entered characters of varying sequences, uh, 20 runs a piece for each SNR value, I average them to compile this table. As you can see, it's exactly what we expect. When your SNR goes up, your bit error ratio goes down, and when your SNR goes down, your bit error ratio goes up significantly. Here's a plot of that data that, again, shows what we've seen in other areas of the course and with other systems. The point two there just depicts the representative 20% uh, bit error ratio, which we established for this effort as something that was unacceptable. Now, in addition to the quantitative analysis using bit error ratio, I wanted to do a qualitative analysis on these real world messages in the form of a picture. My lovely wife was good enough to be our test subject as well as the actual sample message. I will see what's really discernible in each one of these data structures as we gradually add more channel impairments. Here is the received signal for both the text and uh, the picture at 16 dB. As you can see, very low bit error ratios and very, very good message transmission. 
As we increase to uh, more channel degradation at only 12 dB of signal to noise ratio, you can see the, the numbers are, are still favorable, uh, pretty low bit error rates, but the image is starting to degrade and the text message is starting to uh, become a little unreadable. This gets a lot more significant when you drop it by another 4 dB. Now you're at 6 and 9% of bit error rate and you're really having a tough time discerning the message and uh, you're having a tough time making out the image as well. Continuing on to 4 dB, it's very, very noisy and you really can't discern the text message at all and the image is very degraded as well. And finishing up at a 0 dB evaluation, you can barely make out either one. Uh, you can barely even make out the silhouette of the image. So in summary, we've demonstrated through our representative model exactly what we anticipated, that when you deliberately increase your impairments of the already unreliable channel, that you can rapidly degrade your ability for reliable communications. We saw that in terms of a quantitative analysis by studying bit error ratio, but we also saw that in terms of a qualitative analysis, your ability to understand the image or the text message. Now, channel improvement techniques that we learned about in the course, like equalization, diversity, channel coding, that ability will overcome the relatively simple jamming techniques we demonstrated here. So if jamming's to be effective in the future, it's going to have to overcome these more elegant reliability techniques. And that will most likely be the study of some future work. Thank you very much for your time. Have a nice day.